tonight. John 14, please. John chapter 14. <clears throat> and it's good, isn't it, to turn to the word of the Lord at all times. Dr. Vance Havener makes the point, if you see a Bible that's falling apart, it probably belongs to someone who isn't. Let me say that again. If you see a Bible that's falling apart, it probably belongs to someone who isn't. And all of us, I'm sure, that love the Word of God have a Bible like that at home. I know I have one in my study and it's stuck with more bits and pieces than I care to think about. But that's the one I use for my daily reading. That's the one I use for my private times with God. And it's true because as we come to God's Word, we discover there are portions of it that bless our hearts and thrill us that we love to return to again and again. Arnold, uh, Arnold Gavellini um, tells of an old Bible in his possession that had been used on a number of different occasions. And he said many of its pages were clean and perfectly preserved. But again and again he would turn back to John 14 because it was a Bible owned by his grandparents, owned by his parents and now owned by him. And he discovered on that page in John 14 it was absolutely awash with tears that had dropped from eyes as they read these beautiful verses and were drawn closer to the Lord. Now let me say, beloved, it's a wonderful passage of Scripture um, to wear out with reading, but it ought not to be the only passage of Scripture. The Word of God is all of it, Paul reminds Timothy. It's profitable, and it's profitable for everything we need in life. It's profitable that we might grow up in the Lord. And that, of course, is what Paul was talking about in Ephesians 4, that we would grow up in the Lord and that we would, through the gift given in the church, we would adhere to it, we would learn from it, and that we would become a people who were following the Lord. We'll maybe think on that just later. But it's the book, the Word of God, is something that's given to us to strengthen us, to encourage us, to help us. And that's what was happening in John 14, isn't it? Read with me, please, in those first verses. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And where I go ye know, and the way ye know. And Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not where thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. What a passage, what a message. You see, these disciples were beginning to understand that Jesus was going to the cross. Suddenly it was dawning upon them like never before. Suddenly it was hitting them like a ton of bricks. Suddenly it was bringing them to a point that they were realizing that Jesus was going. And if ever you met a group of men who needed some spiritual anesthetic, it was the disciples. And they needed just now to hear a word from the Lord. And he brings this comforting word that we have just read. In a nutshell, Jesus is saying to them, be happy, I'm coming back again. This is not the end, fellas. This is not the end. I'm coming back. And that was his wonderful promise. And dear folks, I wonder that uh, if that promise was given to us personally by Jesus, would it have meant more to us than it means by reading it in his word? See, today we're troubled about everything. Seems we're troubled about the times and we talk much about the times we're living in. We watch the news, we read the new newspapers and we tut and we groan and we become absolutely discouraged because the times we're living in, we're almost afraid to go over the door in some places. We're almost afraid to be on our own, in the, even in the middle of the town. We are afraid of so many things that times take up our thinking to such a degree that it's amazing. But we not only think about the times, we think about things. 
We think about truths. We think about tactics. We think about talks. We think about teams. We think about technology. We we think about theology. We think about tradition. And the one thing we really don't spend enough time on thinking about is the translation. That moment when the Lord shall come. You see, if there's anything, beloved, that should bring happiness and joy and peace to the believer is the thought of Jesus Christ's wonderful return for the church of Jesus Christ. And can I say I believe he's coming sooner than we imagine. I believe his coming is imminent. And we should get serious about imminency. People say, oh, I've been hearing that for years. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. But where is the promise of his coming? Well, Peter reminded reminded us of people who talk like that. And Peter called them scoffers. Don't let's get caught up on that, beloved. Because you see, Peter also reminds us that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. And because it's only a couple of days where God's concerned that Jesus has gone back to heaven. He's not a bit concerned. With us, it's 2,000 years. But where God's concerned, it's only a couple of days since Jesus went back to heaven. But one of these days, he's going to say to his son, Go, get your bride. Go, bring the church home to be with me. And I tell you, that's something that should thrill our very being. That's why Jesus was talking to the disciples the way he was. That's why Jesus was speaking to the disciples with this message. He said, I'm I'm wanting to speak to you fellas. I want to speak to you about a, a precious peace. Hear what I'm saying to you. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. See, he wanted to bring them to a point where no matter what they would face, they would be at peace with God. They would know the peace of God. Turn over with me for a moment or two to Acts chapter 12, please. Acts chapter 12. We all know the story so very well, don't we? Acts chapter 12. And... And we read a part of the story just to give us an insight again. Acts chapter 12 and verse 1. Now about that time heard the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quartarians of soldiers to keep him intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. You see, it was his intent. Seeing how it pleased the Jews to kill James, he thought, well, I'll bring Peter, and I'll kill him also. And I'll tell you, that that will get me top marks. That will please the people. But in verse 5 we read, But Peter therefore was kept in prison, But prayer was made without ceasing by the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. And the keepers before the door kept the prison. Here he is, he's about to be beheaded. He's ready for the executioner's block in the morning. And he's lying Between two soldiers chained. And he's pushing out the Zeds. He's sound asleep. What peace. What contentment. What a joy. To know. That in every situation. The Lord's in control. And we read in verse 7. And behold an angel of the Lord came upon him. And light shone in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side. Listen to this. And raised him up saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. The angel had to hit him a thump and say, Peter, get up. And Peter rose up quickly. He was startled. He rose up quickly. The chains fell off. But not a soldier moved. The angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. Take your time, Peter. Put on your cloak. Tie it around. Put your sandals on, Peter. 
So he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him and knew not that it was true um, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. And when they were past the first and the second guard, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of its own accord. You see, everything is in God's control. Now, please do not ask me why James had to die and Peter didn't. I don't have an answer for that. But see what's happening. Peter knows he's ready for the chopping block. But he's lying sound asleep between two soldiers. And the angel comes in and he rises up quickly. The chains fall fall off and they make their way out and God opens the gate. And I have a feeling closed it behind them. And then the angel departs. And he went out and followed him in verse 9 and knew not that it was true which was done by the angel but thought he saw a vision. And when they were past the first and the second guard they came to the iron gate that leadeth into the city which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews what an amazing moment that was surely that must have thrilled his heart that he could lie asleep content knowing that he could lose his head in the morning because he was at peace with God because he was in that enjoyment of what only God can give peace as we were singing just a few moments ago How wonderfully God orchestrated everything on Peter's behalf. And it's lovely to follow that story through because you know how that Peter went to John Mark's mother's house. Now on this occasion the door was locked against him but the Lord didn't open the door for him. Peter had to knock the door. Someone had to come and open the door. And here's the truth of that, friends. Here's the purpose behind that, that God does what only God can do, but he expects us to do what we should do. And you see, he comes to that point. uh, Jesus is bringing these men to that point where he wants them to understand what it means to be at peace with God. You can remember Job's background, I'm sure, and I think that's another wonderful Uh, example of what it means to trust God, to be at peace with God. And you recall how Job arose that morning. He was a man crowned with blessings. He had everything. One of the richest men, if not the richest man of his day. He had absolutely everything. He arose that morning crowned with blessings. He was a man, the Bible says, who cared for the orphans. He looked after the widows. He um, did so many things even before the days of the law. He was a man who was set apart. He was a man who feared God and eschewed evil. And when he got up that morning, like every other morning, he was a very wealthy man. He had everything going for him. But the day wasn't too far through until someone comes knocking at the door. And we read that he loses all his sheep. He loses the camels. He loses the donkeys. He loses every animal he has. And the servant comes in and tells him each time, Job, I and I only am escaped and everything's gone and the servants have been killed. Job, there's nothing left. And in just a few hours into the day, the man who rose that morning crowned with blessings is a man crippled with bankruptcy. But if this, if, as if that wasn't enough, suddenly another knock on the door or a knock on the tent peg, whatever it was. And they came and they said, Job, I'm sorry, we have bad news for you. Job, your ten children were all meeting in your eldest son's home. And Job, there was a hurricane come in, the like of which we have never seen, and hit your house, your son's house. And Job, the house fell, so it must have been some kind of building. The house fell. And Job, I'm sorry. But every one of your children are dead. Man who woke that morning crowned with blessings. The day is not too far through until he's a man crippled with bankruptcy and crushed with bereavement. 
Yet he can crawl into his bed and he can throw himself down on the bed and cry, The Lord gave. The Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And you remember the story how the devil goes back in before God and says, Okay, I've taken all that he has from him, but let me touch his health and that will sort him out and he'll curse you to your face. And God says, Okay, you do that, but spare his life. You can't take his life. And the devil came back, friends, from being in the presence of God into Job's backyard and touched him. And from, uh, from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet, he covered him in boils and putrefying sores. By the way, just by way of thought, and, I, and I'm, I'm not trying to be rude or arrogant at all, but by way of thought, if the devil could touch Job and in a split second cover him with putrefying sores and boils, could he have touched him again and healed him? I think he could. But think about it. And I'm saying that because you look into the book of the Revelation. Is it chapter 13 or 14? It's either 13, chapter 13 and verse 14 or 14 verse 13. I can't remember offhand. But uh, in that wonderful text we're told that the devil has power to do miracles. So be careful. Don't just be sucked in by everything. But here he is. He's a man rose that morning crowned with blessings. The day is not through, too far through until he's a man absolutely crippled with bankruptcy, crushed with bereavement, covered with boils. And his wee wife comes in and you wouldn't blame her. And eventually she says to Job, Job, that's it. I can go no longer. I can do no more. I can't have a Job. Let's just curse God and die. See, she was using the words of the devil, wasn't she? She was using Satan's language. He'll curse you to your face. And that's what she was saying to Job. Let's just curse God and die. Do you know what she was actually saying? She was actually saying there, why don't we make a suicide pact and quit? Finish it all. And Job looked at her and he said, listen dear. The Lord has given us good things. Do we not receive at the hand of God good? Should we not receive also evil? See, Job didn't know where all this was coming from. He didn't know why it was coming. He didn't know. He couldn't read chapters 1 and 2. He didn't know the end result in chapters 40, chapter 38 through 42. But as far as Job was concerned, he wasn't going to blame God. And in fact, in chapter 13, he said, Even though he slay me, yet will I trust him. You see, dear brothers and sisters, it's possible to come to a point where we have a peace with God that we can face any situation. We can face any problem. We can face any sorrow. We can face any difficulty that comes our way because of the peace that comes from the Lord. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In verse 27 he would say, My peace I give unto you, not as the world give I unto you. But he's giving them a peace that they've not understood before. And that peace comes through believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. John McFadden tells of his four-year-old grandson. We happened to have one of those at the moment, and he's an amazing young man. He came on the phone one night and he said, Granda, just come from Sunday school this afternoon. He says, I want to ask you a question. He said, teacher was telling us how God made everything. And he said, on the way home, I began to wonder, well, if that's so and God made everything, Granda, how did God make himself? He asked mom and dad, and of course they advised that he ring. Next time he said, you're talking to Granda, ask Granda. He'll know. So he just went to the phone and pressed the, the recall button or dial button, whatever it is, these quick dial things, and he asked me there and then. And I was able to try and explain to him in, in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, that Jesus was always there. Whenever anything had a beginning that ever began, Jesus was there. He was equally, he was eternally God. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, the living Word. 
It wasn't that he became God when he was born. He was always God. He was eternally God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And that word, that phrase, with God, means he was face to face with God. He was on a power with God. He was equally God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was essentially God. So that satisfied him, and I did it a lot simpler than that, of course, for him. And then he said, Gund, I have another question for you. And my second question is, why did God make ice cream hard? Well, that was an easier one to answer. But I was reading about John McFadden, a a preacher friend. And his little grandson wanted to put the message on the phone. You know, you lift the phone these days and you're through to whatever, 1511 or whatever it is. And you don't know who you're talking to. But we we like to put a message in ours so that people will know they're getting through to our home. But McFadden, John McFadden's grandson wanted to do this and and the rehearsals went very smoothly. Mommy and Daddy can't come to the phone right now. If you leave your name and number and a brief message, they'll get back to you as soon as possible. So the day came when the message had to be put on and he asked, the little fellow asked to be left alone. And when they came in and pressed the button to see what message he had put on, if he had put the real message on, the message came across, Mommy and Daddy can't come to the phone right now, but if you leave your name and number and any message you care to record, as soon as Jesus comes, we'll get back to you. (laughs) Here was a little fellow that had heard the story of Jesus coming again. And that's what Jesus is saying to them. He said, listen, I want you to understand about this peace because it's all to do with my return. It's all to do with me coming back again. The primitive church thought more about the second coming of Jesus, says Alexander McLaren, than about the death or about heaven. You see, friends, the early Christians were not looking, as I said last night, for a a cleft in the ground called a grave, but they were looking for a cleavage in the sky. They were not taken up with the undertaker. They were looking for the upper taker. Curry Ten Boom says we are not a post-war generation, but a pre-peace generation. Jesus Christ is coming again. Make much of it. Have that peace in your heart. Know the joy of this wonderful truth of the one who is speaking. He says you would trust God. Trust me in the same way. You see, dear friends, belief, trust can be cold. It can be calculating. It can be intellectual. But real trust is warm and wholehearted. It's personal. And Jesus is saying to his disciples, I'm telling you that I'm God. And I want you to trust me as you would trust God. You see, when tragedy strikes, we often say, oh, well, everything will be okay. But that kind of optimism is based just on wishful thinking, isn't it? But you see, here, um, the Lord Jesus is saying, let not your heart be troubled. See, there's no point in me saying to people, well, Everything will be okay unless I can say to them, let not your heart be troubled. If I can't follow it up with believe in God, trust alone in Jesus Christ. You see, that links sentiment to optimism. That links humanity to deity. That's the only way, beloved, we'll come to a point where we enjoy that peace of God which passeth all understanding. He says, I want to talk to you men about a new peace. Then he said to them, I want to talk to you about a new place. Verse 2, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And by the way, that, that word prepare there means to make ready in the Greek language. The Greek scholar A.T. Robinson put it like this. He says, that word likens the word to the Ark of the Covenant going ahead to search out a place of resting. Numbers 10, 23. Often in troublesome times, our hearts find great comfort in knowing that this world is not our home. We're just a passing through. Beloved, always remember it. We are not citizens of earth making our way to heaven. 
We are citizens of heaven making our way through this waste howling wilderness of a world. J.A. Savage writes, what a scene of surpassing grandeur. Not a solitary Elijah going up in a chariot of fire, but untold millions of glorified saints mounting upwards in the power of God, clad with the radiance of heaven itself, and doubtless filling its fault with their loud hallelujahs. How paltry and insignificant is all that man calls great and grand in the pageantry of this world, compared with the splendor of this heavenly scene, of this heavenly home. Who would not wish to be there? End of quote. He says, I'm going to prepare a new place for you. And you know what? Jesus called that place his father's house. And I think that's lovely. What a delightfully warm phrase that is. The Old Testament has little to say about heaven or paradise. Some sketches here and there. Abram's bosom conveys some slight understanding of of what heaven is like. But it's not until Jesus come and comes and begins to speak with first hand knowledge that we really get a glimpse into our eternal home. I remember when I first left home and I was a young man of nineteen and that's so many years ago. But I was saved at sixteen and I was a baker and confectioner, as I shared with you last night. And I left home at 19 and took up a position with one of the large bakeries in Belfast. And from Armagh to Belfast, while well, it's about 40 miles, uh, but you had to get a bus in those days, and uh, it was quite a distance. And we had to, I had to live in, in digs. I lived uh, with a lady off the, <coughs> in Belfast off the Ormer Road. Uh, but I can always remember as I made that bus journey up home and it had to be a bus for I didn't have a vehicle but I would walk up that long lane up towards our house about a mile and a half and I would walk down the road towards our home and in through the gate and in through the door and through the laundry on the floor and shout it's me I'm home well it was my father's house wasn't it But you see, to me, it was always home. Now, my father wasn't a man for displaying great emotion. But I remember the first time I I went home. I'll never forget it. He never, ever said it again. But I remember the first time I went in, I shouted and I left the laundry down and I shouted, it's me, I'm home. He came out and he put his big arm around me and he said, son, this house has never been the same since you've left. My mother wept and she threw her arms around me and she says, you don't need to go back, do you? I says, I do, mother. I'm working down there. But you see, the point is this, that I was welcome home. I didn't have to ring up. Well, they had no phone in those days in our house, but I didn't have to ring somebody and say, go tell mom and dad I'm coming home or go ask them, is it all right? This was home. I didn't have to be invited. I didn't have to knock the door. I didn't have to ask if it was okay. I just arrived unannounced and walked in the back door and was welcomed. It's home. The Lord Jesus says, listen, fellas, I'm going back to my father's house. I'm going home. And do you know what? I'm going to be preparing a place for you in my home. That's where we're going to live. And you see, the very phrase, my father's house, just hits me between the eyes and reminds me it's a localized place. It is somewhere. It's not some mythical place. But it's a localized place. It's somewhere and it's substantial. This is not just some dim hope of the mind. This is something that I can look forward to where I will dwell forevermore, where all wrongs will be put right, where forevermore I'll be with the Lord Jesus. Sometimes I'm having a hard time waiting and getting there.
I love the story of the, we call it the prodigal son. Luke, Luke 15. I often <clears throat> prefer to think about it as the story of the father and two delinquent sons. But I often think about that story that when the prodigal, as we call him, went off, the father didn't send the older brother out after him in a month or two and say, go find your brother. Bring some money with him in case he needs help. He didn't say to the mule traders or the camel trains that came by, listen, my son's away down in the far country. If you meet him, would you give him a few shillings and I'll pay you when you come round? A few shekels. He didn't even go looking for him himself. You see, the son, you remember the story, it came to a point where he, he said, there's food enough and to spare even for the servants. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit. He said, even for those that work for my father, there's enough and to spare. The table spread and I'm sitting here eating pig's swill. I'll arise and go to my father and say, and you know the, the background. The father's watching. And he sees him away off down the road. And the father, the old man, picks up his garment because his garment would be a flowing gown to the ankles. And he picks up his garments and he pulls the garment up and his ankles are seen and he begins to run through the village to meet his son. And that, of course, is bringing great shame on the old man. The son has absolutely disgraced him. But he's been watching for the son and he picks up the garments and takes shame and disgrace on himself and runs towards the son. And when he meets him outside the village or outside the town, he embraces him and showers kisses upon him and forgives him, shows a father's love and forgiveness. And you know what? The son never did have to say, Father, would you... Forgive me. I want you to be, I want you to, I want to be one of your hired servants. He never did have to get to that part of the statement. He had it all organized, but he never had to say, I want to be one of your, your hired servants. You see, that embrace of forgiveness and love said it all. He was home. And when the father got him up to the door, he said to the servants, bring all that's needed, get him cleaned up, put a, a, a gown on him and put ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. I want you to know that he's home and he's home to stay and he's forgiven absolutely because this is his home. It's my home, but because he's mine, he's home. You see the Lord said to them, I want to talk to you guys about a new peace. I want to talk to you about a, a new place. And by the way, can I say it, dear friends, that that's all the more reason we should know the Word of God. That's all the more reason we should spend time in the Word of God. And maybe you're saying to me, well, that's okay for you, but I'm, I'm just not... Um, as able as some to read the word of God and understand it. Let me do something for you. Just look with me at Psalm 19, please. Psalm 19 for a moment or two. And in Psalm 19, you know, there are two beautiful revelations of God. In this, one in the uh, revelation of God in the skies. You remember that? Verses 1 through 6. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. God never left himself without an excuse. There was always wonderful witness to God. God says, listen, there's a revelation in the skies of me. Any time people want to know anything about God, they've just got to look up. That's why people even in darkest Afri Africa bow down and worship idols and worship something because there's a God-shaped vacuum in here. And God never left himself without a witness. And what a revelation that is. A revelation of himself in the skies. But then he gave a revelation of himself in the scriptures, verse 7 through 14. And if we were to take tonight, because time doesn't permit me to do it all, but if I were to take 7, 8, and 9, those three verses, in those three verses there's a wonderful, beautiful um, insight into God's heart. 
He gives us a revelation of himself in the scriptures. He gives us in those three verses six titles of the word of God. He gives us in those three verses six characters of the word of God. And he gives us in those three verses six benefits of the word of God. Let me show you what I mean. For the law of the Lord. Now that's a title for the word of God. The law of the Lord. And that's the teaching law, the Torah. And the psalmist is reminding us that the law of the Lord, the teaching word of the Lord, is what? It's perfect. It's complete. Needs nothing added. Needs nothing taken from it. It's sufficient. He says the law of the Lord, that's a title for the word of God, is perfect. That's the benefit, of, the character of the word of God converting in the authorized it says converting the soul in the original text in the original hebrew it says transforming the soul that's the benefit of the word of god that's the power of the word of god because the word of god alone can transform the soul nobody ever gets saved apart from the word of god nobody but then he goes on to say secondly the testimony of the lord now that's another title for the word of god but that's not this time the teaching word. It's this time the testimony word. This is God testifying on his own behalf. And he's reminding us, the psalmist is reminding us that this is God's testimony. And he said, listen, the testimony of the Lord is what? Sure. Certain. Dependable. You can bank on it. You can lean on it. You'll never break God's promises by leaning upon them. Never. But here's where I'm coming to. Here's the benefit of this word of God. Making wise the simple. Now the psalmist's not being rude. He's just simply saying this. Listen, if we take God's word seriously, as we saw last night, if we put shoe leather to it and make it work, then God will teach us all we need to know. We may be less knowledgeable than others, but we can come to a point where the psalmist came to in Psalm 119 where he said, I know more than all my teachers. I know more than all the ancients through reading the Word. And he didn't have a full Bible like we do. But through reading the Word, through reading whatever Scriptures he had, he said, I've come to a point where I know more than all my teachers and all the ancients. See, dear friends, God's word is precious to him. He said in one of the Psalms, I have magnified my word above all my name. That's how important God's word is to him. And oh, if it's important to us, why he will teach us things. He will bring us to places that we have never known blessing like it. He will bring us to a point where not only will the peace of God reign in our hearts, but the joy of spending eternity in his home, in his presence, in that new place he's preparing for us will just ignite us like uh, lighting the blue touch paper. And daily we'll arise from our beds to meet the day, rejoicing and praising the Lord and getting into this thing of living before people as we should live living like Christians why not just be Christians one old preacher preached on one occasion that's what God wants us to be he says listen fellas I want to talk to you about a new peace I want to talk to you about a new place but he said finally I want to talk to you about a new pledge a new pledge see this was a precious peace he was talking about it was a prepared place he was talking about. And it was a powerful pledge. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Listen, folks, the sovereign God. The Son of God, the Spirit of God, have built an entire eschatology around those words, I will come again. For years they had known Jesus would come again, but it hadn't sunk in. How did they know that? Why, Luke 1, as we were reading last night, 30 through 33. They knew that Jesus would come again. But oh, they didn't know that he would come in this manner. That he would come for them. 
He didn't know, they didn't know 1 Thessalonians 4. But Jesus said to them, boys, listen, I want you to know this new peace. I want you to know about this new place. But I want you to know about this place, this new pledge, because I'm coming back for you. You see, it was a promise coming. If I go, I will come again. It was a personal coming. Jesus himself would come. It was a powerful coming. He would rescue them from the presence of sin. He would redeem the body from the grave if we were buried. He would reward the servants when he would get us there. It was a preeminent coming, superior to and surpassing all others. It was a predetermined coming, already settled in heaven. It was a prepared for coming. Are you ready, dear Christian, for that coming? Excuse me getting excited. As I said last evening, we love to say we are strong premillennial. We love to say that we wouldn't change our view. But has that truth changed us? Am I ready? Am I right for Jesus coming? Benjamin Disraeli was our first elected as an MP. And he stood in the House of Commons on one occasion to give his maiden speech. But he was shouted down. His peers didn't like him because he was frumpish in dress. His manner was considered grotesque. His nationality was Jewish. And many of those so-called gentlemen of the British Parliament disliked him intently and would not allow him to finish his speech. They shouted him down. And eventually the speaker restored. Calm, he asked Mr. Disraeli, if he had anything further to say. This really stood to his feet and said, Sir, thank you for the opportunity, but I will sit down again in a moment. But be assured, you will hear from me at a later date. End quote. As Prime Minister, this really led Britain to its greatness, to its wealth, and prosperity. Whatever else we may think of him, under Victoria, he did great things for this country. And by the way, just because I come from Northern Ireland doesn't mean that I'm Irish. I'm British. I would like you to know that. But you see, this, beloved, is the day of our Lord's rejection. This is the day that We remember Judas betrayed him. Peter denied him. His disciples fled from him. The Jews mocked him. The Romans crucified him. And to this day, the world at large has little use for the one we call Jesus Christ. And he has gone back to heaven. But he's saying to this world, you will hear from me again. I will come again. And the last book of the Bible closes that wonderful book, shouting down the ages, surely I will come quickly. And it's the saved of the earth who respond by saying, even so come Lord Jesus. The late scientist Harry Rimmer once heard Charles Fuller announce on his radio program the old-fashioned revival hour and that on the following Sunday he would speak on the subject of heaven. Rimmer sat down and wrote him a letter. This is the content of the letter. Next Sunday, sir, you're going to talk about heaven. I'm interested in that land because I have held a clear title to a bit of property there for about 50 years. I did not buy it. It was given to me without price. But the donor purchased it for me at a tremendous sacrifice. I am not holding it for speculation. It's not a vacant lot. For more than half a century, I have been sending materials up to the great architect of the universe who has been building a home for me, which will never need remodeling or repairing because it will suit me perfectly individually and will never grow old. Termites can never undermine its foundation for it rests upon the rock of ages. Fire cannot destroy it. Floods cannot wash it away. No locks or bolts will ever be placed upon the doors, for no vicious person can enter that land where my dwelling stands. Almost completed and almost ready for me to enter in and abide uh, in eternity without fear of being ejected. There is a valley deep, uh, 
There is a valley, a valley of deep shadow between this place where I live and that to which I shall journey in a very short time. I cannot reach my home in that city without passing through this valley. But I am not afraid because the best friend I ever had went through that same valley long ago and has driven all away and driven away all its gloom. He has stuck with me through thick and thin since we first became acquainted 50 years ago. I own his promise in printed form never to, to forsake me or to leave me alone. He will be with me when I walk through the valley of the shadow and I shall not lose my way when he is with me. I hope to hear your sermon in heaven next Sunday, but I have no assurance I shall be able to do so. My ticket to heaven has no date mark for the journey, no return coupon, no permit for baggage. But yes, I'm ready to go. And I may not be here while you're talking next Sunday evening, but I will meet you there someday. End quote. Harry Rimmer moved to his new abode two days later. What a wonderful place Jesus is preparing. What a wonderful peace he gives us while we're waiting. But what a wonderful pledge. He will come again. I'm waiting for the coming of the bridegroom in the air. I'm longing for the, the gathering of the ransomed over there. I'm putting on the garments which the heavenly bride shall wear. For the glad homecoming draweth nigh. Oh, dear saints of God, look up. Your redemption draweth nigh. The one who has loved you and you love because he first loved you is about to come, receive you unto himself. Are you ready for his coming? Will you be right at his coming? I address this to my own heart, as I said last evening and this afternoon. Are you waiting with joy? Will your heart rejoice when you see him in the air? Will your soul leap for joy? And will your eternal bliss be his presence over there? Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We honor you. We glorify you. We magnify your name. We love you, Jesus, because you first loved us. And what a blessing you've given us in giving to us a peace that no man can steal from us. Preparing for us a place in which we will live for all eternity. And giving us a promise, a pledge that will never be broken because it was sealed with the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray you'll take us from this place tonight rejoicing, prepared to worship you tomorrow as you allow. And may our worship never be the same again. May we worship you in spirit and in truth, in the beauty of holiness, with clean hands and a pure heart. And should you come for us before that morning dawns and the shadows flee away, may we truly be ready to meet you. Thank you for the dear people that have gathered with us. Thank you, Lord, for the blessing of serving them in ministry. We ask, Lord, that your word will do its own work in every heart, for Jesus' sake. Amen. <laughs>